Thank you, Professor Yang. Uh, first of all, <coughs> I'd like to thank uh, Professor Huang Yang and also uh, Dr. Anka Dan for their uh, most kind invitation. I would also like to thank them for organizing such a fascinating workshop uh, in this beautiful city on a topic that is of great interest to me personally, uh, that is the barbarian. In ancient Greece, the collective pan-Hellenic identity of the Hellenic ethnos, which was used to connect the highly fractious and very heterogeneous Greek sub-ethne, such as the Dorians, Ionians, Aeolians, etc., across the Mediterranean and Black Sea, was sometimes expressed via what modern scholars have termed polarity, an oppositional identity uh, in relation to the so-called barbarian. A host of scholarship has arisen to address the question of when exactly the notion of uh, the Greek barbarian polarity or antithesis uh, first appeared. Some have associated its invention in brackets with Athenian drama, with Aeschylus in particular. This is, of course, uh, <clears throat> Edith Hall's famous argument. Uh, in the context of Athenian propaganda vis-a-vis -vis members of the Delian League in the 5th century BC. The more overtly xenophobic, in brackets, 4th century BC has also been considered a possible uh, a context for its conception. This was the argument of Benjamin Isaac in 2004. Others have placed the origin of the practice of antithetical othering much earlier in the 9th century BC, viewing it as one of the consequences of the Ionian experience of settlement and conflict uh, during the Greek migration to the coasts of Asia Minor. And this is, of course, the opinion of Irid Melkin, uh, expressed in 1998. It has furthermore been argued that Hellenicity, in brackets, was articulated sometime in the archaic period uh, via the process of interaction between members of the pan-Hellenic elite through intermarriage and participation in the Olympic Games. And this is, of course, uh, Jonathan Hall's argument in 1997 and 2002. However, such a focus on polarity and othering at the expense of other interpretations and the application of uh, somewhat admittedly anachronistic uh, modern 20th century categories and standards of differentiation to a very complicated and very messy ancient phenomenon has provoked an understandable backlash. Eric Gruen has argued that the dichotomy of Greeks and barbarians in Greek literature should not be overemphasized, and that Aeschylus, and other classical Greek writers do not overwhelmingly relegate the Persians to the category of the other. Gruen's argument that authors such as Aeschylus, Herodotus, and Xenophon show market signs of respect for the Persians and do not necessarily uh, always present the enemy as the other is probably correct. And a similar argument was made earlier by Isaac for the supposedly more pluralistic 5th century writers. More recently, uh, Costas Vlasopoulos has argued, quite rightly, I believe, that analyses based on polarity and othering are insufficient to analyze the very complex process of interaction between Greeks and non-Greeks, uh, conflict and polar polarity, articulation of oppositional identity, if you like. He argues, uh, and he is following uh, Melkin's analysis of Mediterranean networks, they always coexisted with more positive interactions via an intricate network of exchange which facilitated acculturation, at times Hellenization, and also adoption uh, by the Greeks of foreign practices and ideas. Greek identity was therefore highly complex, both aggregative and oppositional, depending very much on the context. And it cannot be explained or understood by a simple dichotomy of Greeks versus barbarians. The, Greek, uh, the ancient Greek world and its peoples were indeed astonishingly heterogeneous. Ancient Greek society, as we now know it, was arguably the product of intense cultural and ethnic mixing and mutual interdependence and exchange between Greeks and barbarians. Thus, the representation or representations of ethnic identity among the Greek people or peoples of the Mediterranean was inherently unstable and almost always open to negotiation and reinterpretation. However, I would argue that the term barbaros, an oppositional identity, which was perhaps excessively magnified by modern commentators for rhetorical effect between two certainly problematic but suitably vague and overarching categories, Greek and barbarian, clearly does feature more prominently in classical Greek literature than in the earlier archaic Greek literature. 
Whether or not one sees this as amounting to strong antithetical othering, the practice of setting Greeks apart from barbarians, in most cases, of course, uh, to the detriment of the barbarians, is detectable, or at, at the very least alluded to in virtually all the classical sources that are available to us, regardless of the possible pluralism of individual authors such as Herodotus and Sophocles. Now, why this is so, and the historical context that brought about uh, this phenomenon in Greek literature are the focal points of discussion of this paper. Now, as outlined above, uh, scholarship had until recently been preoccupied with identifying a specific historical moment for the articulation of an oppositional identity that separated the Greeks uh, from the barbarians in Greek uh, literary discourse. The Persian Wars were acknowledged as the de facto consensus moment when the barbarian was supposedly invented. However, as Skinner and Vlasopoulos have shown, if the barbarian implies the articulation of an oppositional identity, an antithetical othering, such negative sentiments and polarity can already be detected in archaic Greek literature and art, albeit, of course, in less apparent forms. While it is true that uh, antithetical othering became more extreme or pronounced in the classical period, I believe that one can no longer argue that such representations were entirely absent from the archaic period. No doubt, as the Greeks encountered foreign peoples via the process of settlement and trade across the Mediterranean, both mutually beneficial contexts and at times hostile uh, collisions would have taken place, allowing for the articulation of both aggregative and oppositional identities, triggered in part by the growing Greek interest in foreign peoples and their customs, how these foreigners are similar or different from the Greeks themselves, a curiosity that uh, obviously contributed uh, to the birth of Greek ethnography in the 6th and the 5th centuries uh, BC. However, while the, the articulation of oppositional identity, probably a far more ancient human phenomenon rather than a particular classical or archaic Greek sociopolitical construct, while that can no longer be identified with a specific political context or historical moment, somewhat curiously, uh, the birth of the barbarian, uh, I believe, can still be situated in a particular historical and political context, namely the Ionian Greek struggle against the Persians in the late 6th century BC. It is perhaps not an exaggeration uh, to claim that the origin of the term barbaros is the key to understanding firstly what the, the notion of the barbarian implied to the ancient Greeks, and secondly the pecu uh, pecu uh, peculiarities of the Greek representation of non-Greeks in the late archaic and classical periods. The word barbaros is first attested as uh, uh, Greg uh, pointed out earlier, uh, in the Iliad, in the catalogues uh, section of Book 2, where the Carians are referred to as Barbara Phonon in line uh, 867. This would imply that already during the early archaic period, the term Barbaros was used to denote foreign peoples and certain stereotypes. However, the existence of this term so early in Greek literature is highly suspect, since Thucydides, later in the 5th century, argued that Homer did not mention the word barbaros at all. This is Thucydides, uh, book 133. Despite some modern attempts to explain away Thucydides' observation, it should be taken far more seriously, especially since this early attestation of the term occurs in the notorious catalogues section of book two, which famously was all too vulnerable to later interpolations. For example, the distortion of the number of Athenian ships to favor the Athenians, which presumably happened uh, during the late 6th century BC. Several other important factors relating to the, this entry on the Carians suggest very strongly, I would argue, that this is indeed a post-5th century interpolation. The term barbarophanon is a hapax legomenon, and nowhere else in the catalogues does the poet ever note the linguistic peculiarity of any specific ethnic group mentioned by name. As a group, yes, but not as a specific ethnic group. This makes the epithet highly suspect. The fact that the Carians alone are singled out for such treatment is also very significant, since this in all likelihood suggests knowledge of 5th, 5th century Ionian slash Athenian traditions, making the Carians among the earliest non-Greeks, that is barbarians according to classical understanding, encountered by the Greeks. For example, the story told in Thucydides 1.4 concerning the expulsion of the Carians from the Cyclades by Greeks under Minos. 
From the point of view of post fifth century Ionian slash Athenian Greeks, the Carians were thus the ideal representatives of the barbarian genos in the time frame attributed to the action of the Iliad. Yet such a representation is, I would argue, incongruous with the 8th and 7th century BC perspective and context of the Homeric epics. The interpolation may in fact have been triggered by the 5th century Ionian and also Athenian preoccupation with their ethnic purity, reflected in the foundation stories involving Ionian Greeks killing or expelling non-Greek Carians in Asia Minor instead of coexisting with them as our archaeological evidence shows. It may, also have been, uh, it may also have something to do with the Athenian political propaganda regarding their autochthony, which supposedly made them more Greek and superior than the Peloponnesians and the Thebans, who were associated with barbarians via uh, their founding heroes, the Lydian Phrygian Pelops, the Egyptian Danaos, and uh, the Phoenician Cadmus. The particular emphasis given to uh, the Carians in the catalogues and their unique barbarization are surely connected to the fact that they were rearticulated as the main early primordial foreign enemies of Ionian migrants in Asia Minor during the classical period. Like the interpolation of the huge number of Athenian ships into the catalogues, the pseudo attention given uh, to the Carians in the great Panhellenic epic helps bring attention uh, to the Ionians, including the Athenians, who are otherwise almost completely absent from the heroic narrative of Homer. So by magnifying the Athenian or Ionian contingent and by projecting the struggle of the Ionians with the Carians onto the epic stage via the barbarization of the Carians, the interpolation serves the purpose of including, including the Ionians among the Greeks, and it also simultaneously addresses uh, concerns regarding the Greekness of the Ionians and the Athenians, which was questioned by other Greeks. Of course, uh, the non-Athenian and non-Ionian Herodotus famously argued that the Athenians were originally barbarian Pelasgians. This is Herodotus Book 157, that the Dorians are the uh, true Greeks, and that Ionians are supposedly in origin Athenians, and therefore likewise barbarians, even after their Hellenization have mixed ex ex uh, extensively with non-Greek Carians. The Athenians and the Ionians of the fifth century BC thus needed to prove their Greekness and also to defend their claims to autochthony. What better way to do this than to find vindication in the most Greek of all things, the Homeric epics, by sharply distinguishing themselves, now inserted among the Greeks via the interpolation of the large number of Athenian ships already in ancient times from the clearly foreign and other Carians, with whom they were accused by uh, other Greeks of having mixed extensively. This explains why the seventh century Carians in the Iliad are othered with the sixth century term Barbaros, Further evidence for the interpolation can be found in the fact that other than this highly disputable attestation, there is no other example in all of archaic Greek literature before the late 6th century BC of the use of the term barbaros. We find rather neutral references to foreign speech, such as alathroos and alaglosoi in the Odyssey. And we also find in the Odyssey the term agriophonus with a clearly negative connotation to describe the sentients, but never barbaros. In fact, the use of the word barbaros is extremely rare, even in, in the late 6th century BC. It is only attested three times in total. In an Acrian fragment 423, in Hecateus fragment 119, in Heraclitus fragment 107. As a noun appellation, it is found later than we would expect in Hecateus. Therefore, uh, the word barbaros only first appears, it seems, in Greek literature, uh, in the 6th century BC? If so, then where did this term come from? And what did it mean? Since the time of Strabo in antiquity, many have taken for granted that the term barbaros in Greek literature was originally an onomatopoeic word associated with the inability to speak Greek, which marked the foreigner off as inferior. However, it is, not, it is now accepted by some scholars that, ter that, that the, the term is actually a foreign loan word. So Edith Hall, for example, following Weidner, argued that the word is probably of Sumerian Akkadian derivation. Weidner asserted that the Sumerian word bar, which means outside, exterior, outskirts as a noun, and possibly, though this lacks documentary evidence, foreign as an adjective, can be reduplicated into barbar. This hypothetical word, he claimed, 
could have meant foreigner. Now the problem with this idea is that all the documented examples of the word barbar in Sumerian do not have the meaning foreigner, but actually refers to a part of a weaver's loom. Uh, and Weidner went on to argue that this hypothetical Sumerian word barbar, supposedly meaning foreigner, was taken over by Akkadian scribes and rendered barbaru, supposedly meaning foreigner. And then somehow this passed on into archaic Greek. However, again, uh, there are problems with this assertion because the Akkadian word barbaru means wolf or jackal, not foreigner. Barbaru could possibly derive in some way from the Sumerian urbara, which is a compound word formed from ur, dog, or wolf, plus bar, outside, meaning literally an outside dog or wild dog, in other words, a wolf. However, whether the reduplication of bar here is, is from Sumerian bar is quite uncertain. Did this Akkadian word for wolf somehow pass into Greek? It is not completely impossible, obviously, but then we're left with the perplexing question as to why, if Weidner is correct, the Greeks would have chosen to borrow a stylized Sumerian-derived word rather than the general Semitic word for wolf, zibu, in Akkadian, which uh, from proto-Semitic dib or zib, uh, which is also found in Western Semitic languages with which uh, Greek was in close proximity. Furthermore, how can we explain the fact that the word barbaros does not have any meaning that approximates dog or wolf in Greek, and that it does not appear in archaic Greek literature until the Persian period? Did the Greeks pick up this word and then apply it to foreigners because to them, foreign languages sounded like dogs barking? Or did they use it as an insult, likening, dogs, uh, likening foreigners to dogs? But then why didn't they use the Greek word for dog instead of this foreign word of obscure origin? It seems clear that the Sumerian Akkadian derivation for the word barbaros is more speculative than conclusive. Now, I'll launch into some speculation of my own here. Um, uh, old Persian, I believe, uh, may provide us with some answers about the origin of the term barbaros. In Old Persian, there was a term barabara, literally he who carries a burden or a load. This term still survives in New Persian as barbar, a carrier or a porter. We also find a similar term rendered in Elamite script as barabaras. The word bara from bar, old Persian to beer, which is etymologically linked to the old Indian Sanskrit term bara, could also mean tax. So barabara or barbara could mean either the carrier or bearer of a burden or tax, taxpayer. I would suggest that this term, rather than the Sumerian derivation suggested by Edith Hall and Weidner, uh, was the, the prototype of the Greek term barbaros. Now this would mean that uh, the barbarian was initially a political category, first and foremost, and not necessarily a cultural or ethnic category. In other words, the classical Greek word barbaros did not mean originally or solely speakers of an alien tongue, i.e. foreigners, but those who were subject to the Persians and had become taxpayers to the Persian king. This hypothesis is strengthened by the fact that the word barbaros only starts to be used in the late 6th century BC in Ionia, and then later throughout Greece in the context of the Greek struggle against the Persians, primarily as a designation for Persians, or rather Medes, and their subjects, uh, subjects in Asia. This explains why the word barbaros, in contrast to the more Greek term alaglosoi, which denoted solely the linguistic difference between Greeks and non-Greeks, came to encapsulate a variety of socio-political concepts, such as subservience, slavery, medizing, and being a Persian subject. The old Persian derivation also provides a logical explanation as to why people whom our Greek sources in the early and mid fifth century called barbarians are overwhelmingly the residents of the Middle East because they were the ones conquered and subjected uh, by the Persians and paying taxes to the Persian king. It also explains how the Greeks were able to categorize people as different from one another as the Egyptians and the Indians as a single entity. They were all taxpayers and subjects, i.e. in Greek ideology, slaves of the Persian autocrat invading Hellas to deprive Greeks of their political freedom. The strong emphasis on political differentiation, that is, tyranny versus freedom, and the political liberty of the Greeks in contrast to the so-called slavery of the barbarian, which even more than linguistic uh, differentiation is central to the Greek representation 
of the Barbaroi, the literature of the fifth and fourth centuries BC, uh, supports this line of reasoning. It is indeed in this context that one should perhaps also interpret the earliest attestations of the term Barbaros mentioned above. The lyric poet Anacreon in the late sixth century BC states with a recognizably contemptuous tone, and lay to rest, O Zeus, that foreign sound, in case you talk barbarian style. The remark of Anacreon about speaking in barbarian style at first sight seems to focus on speech and it seems to identify barbarian with speaking a foreign language. However, the use of the term in the work of the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus is a little bit more ambiguous. He says, poor witnesses for men are their eyes and ears if they have barbarian souls. Is Heraclitus referring to speech passions or more probably some form of moral or political defect identified with, with being barbaros? It is highly conceivable that what is being implied is that the testimony of someone with a barbarian soul, whether Greek or non-Greek, was worthless and bad, not because the person couldn't speak or understand Greek, but because he has sold out his soul, in brackets, to the Persians and has medized, i.e. has turned a traitor. Similarly, speaking in barbarian style may have been odious to Anacreon, not just because it was foreign, but because it may have implied the language of subservience uh, to the Persians. The remaining fragment of Hecateus does not refer to differences in languages as whole, but highlights ethnic difference by identifying the original inhabitants of Greece, uh, of the Peloponnese in particular, as barbarian. That is, non-Greeks who had migrated to Greece from the east, for example, Pelops, Danaos, and Cadmus, and were associated with peoples who later became uh, subjects of the Persian Empire. So it is no accident, then, that the first references to barbarians occur in the 6th century uh, in 6th century Ionia, when for the first time, the Greeks were exposed to the prospect of becoming barbaroi, or taxpayers. Perhaps revealingly, the Greek word for tribute, phoros, that is taxes, that were paid by the Ionians to the Persians and then later to the Athenians, has the same root meaning as the Persian word bara, to bear or carry a load. It is likely then that uh, the, the hostility towards barbaroi was at least at the beginning not primarily part of the ongoing process of articulating an, an oppositional identity vis-a-vis -vis foreign peoples, but rather the consequence of the Greek rejection of the idea of becoming taxpayers or subjects of the alien Persian king. This term would then quickly become equated with foreign speech since all taxpayers to the Persian king were, or should be, non-Greeks. Now, revealingly in the Persae, Asia and the non-Greeks, or the Barbar Barbaroi in general, i.e. those who live on the continent ruled by the Persians, are equated. So in line 12, somewhat remarkably, Aeschylus refers to the Asiatic race, Asiatogenes, and manages to fit a plethora of ethnic groups as diverse and different from each other as the Lydians, Persians, Babylonians, and even Egyptians into this race reared in the land of Asia, Cuthon Asiatis. Xerxes is called the ruler of Asia, and the Greek land, Helada, is seen as being distinct from that of the Asians, or the Barbaron. In line 255, the Persian army is called the army of the barbarians, and in line 337, the fleet at Salamis is also referred to as that of the Barbaron, in juxtaposition with the Helesin. Further into the play, the Persian queen equates the Persians with the Barbaron, and in line 635, the Persian language is referred to as Barbara, Ethnic and linguistic differentiation thus becomes rhetorically submerged in the antithetical division between Hellas, Hellenes, and Asia, Barbaroi. And the geographical locus of the barbarian is firmly fixed in Asia, that is the Persian Empire. Furthermore, in Aeschylus, linguistic differentiation is not the only meaningful, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, is not the only meaning implicit in the word barbaros, nor is it the most prominent meaning overall. Barbaros is primarily a designation for the Persians and their Asian subjects invading Greece to deprive Hellas of its political freedom. It is also notable that after the successful repulse of Xerxes' invasion, the dichotomy of Greek democracy and barbarian tyranny is regarded by Aeschylus as perhaps the most prominent distinguishing feature between Greeks and barbarians. For instance, in the suppliant women, King Pelasgus is fearful of arriving at a final decision without the approval of the demos. 
voting and other features of Greek Eleutheria are emphatically stressed and contrasted with the despotic inclinations of the Egyptian Danaids, who argue that the king is authority unto himself. The Greek leader is always careful to act in accordance with the laws. The men of Egypt, in contrast, use beer and outright violence in defiance of the laws. So this is hubris, another uh, fictive attribute of the barbarian. In tragedy, the rhetoric of the opposition between Greek, or rather Athenian democracy, and barbarian tyranny obviously did matter, regardless of actual realities, which was obviously very different. Thus, the Greek representation of the barbarian was peculiar in that it was born out of a particular historical and political circumstance, the Greek interaction from a position of weakness with the superpower of the age, that is the Persian Empire. The fear of Persia and Greek vulnerability in the face of the Persian onslaught forced the Greeks to differentiate themselves politically, first and foremost, from other Near Eastern and Eastern Mediterranean peoples who had been conquered by the Persians. They were compelled to create for themselves a new political and eventually cultural identity divorced from the Persian-dominated Near Eastern world, with which in earlier times, before the arrival of the Persians, the Greeks had actually felt no qualms about affili affiliating themselves with, as evidenced by the myths of uh, foreign Near Eastern founders of Greek cities, and ethne, which was articulated during the archaic period. This political divide implies, uh, implied in the uh, use of the word barbaros was then integrated uh, with the pre-existing modes of oppositional ide identity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, foreigners to create a peculiar classical definition of collective Greek identity and the familiar a Greek barbarian antithesis, which categorized the barbarians as slaves and the Greeks as free men. Hence, Euripides' famous statement via the voice of Helen, all Barbary is slave except a single man. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>